This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit garynorth.com forward slash free books to download this book on PDF. The title of this book is Westminster's Confession, The Abandonment of Van Til's Legacy by Gary North, Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas, copyright Gary North, 1991. Chapter 9. Abusing the Past. Quote, the appeal to the ancestral constitution satisfies the canon that it must seem rational and persuasive that both its proponents and those they persuaded could, if pressed, defend themselves by some rules of logic and evidence that they would themselves accept. It is therefore a legitimate historical exercise to examine the argument seriously. Dot, 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 quote. M.I. Finley, 1975. We come now to the topic in which I can claim professional certification, history. The last two decades of my life have been spent rather like the character described in a Stephen Leacock story. Quote, he leaped onto his horse and rode off in all directions. End quote. Multi-directionalism is the Christian Reconstructionist's version of Vern Poitras's multi-perspectivalism. Such furious omnidirectional writing is the burden of Christian Reconstructionists. Everything needs reconstructing, so everything becomes a reformer's snare and temptation. History, however, is where I know best how the game is played. There are at least a few legitimate reasons for going to graduate school, but the best one is that if you pay careful attention and you do not get taken in, you will learn how professionals in a particular field systematically fool the laity. If the reader ever begins to doubt the reality of this process, he should think back to the scene in the movie The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy's dog Toto pulls aside the curtain, revealing the little man and his machine, and the wizard's giant floating head commands Dorothy and her friends, quote, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, end quote. On the contrary, pay very close attention to the man behind the curtain. Ancestral Constitutions Finley speaks of the Ancestral Constitution. There are three ancestral constitutions in Anglo-American Presbyterian Calvinism. Only the first two are ever discussed, yet the third one is by far the central one today. The first constitution is the immense body of literature written by John Calvin, but above all, his Institutes of the Christian Religion. A constitution is always brief, However, and brevity was not Calvin's gift. Thus, his writings have become a gigantic grab bag for constructing retroactive constitutions. This is why so many groups have been able plausibly to appeal back to Calvin, even the Barthians. One thing is clear, however. No Calvinist today accepts Calvin's view of the church-state relationships, most of them, but not the theonomists, side politically with Servetus. This was not true of the authors of the Second Constitution. The Second Constitution is the Westminster Confession of Faith and its two catechisms, 1647. Although very little attention is paid to the catechisms, especially the larger one, as far as I know, there is only one detailed commentary on it, Thomas Ridgely's, published in 1731. The only major commentary on the shorter catechism is Samuel Willard's Complete Body of Divinity, published in 1726, written in the midst of a religion-launched civil war. The Westminster Confession was self-consciously stripped by its authors of most of Calvinism's political character. Yet the English Civil War was the product of a battle between Calvinism and a strange alliance between Catholicism and Arminianism. Without Calvinism, and particularly without the Scottish Covenanters, it is inconceivable that the war would have occurred. Marxist historians to the contrary notwithstanding. English Calvinism of the 17th century could not be contained inside the cloister until after 1660. The Third Constitution is the 1788 revision of the 1647 Confession, and very few Presbyterians can tell you what was changed, when, and especially why. They do not know that these changes were first proposed during the same week and in the same city that the Constitutional Convention had assembled. 
with the exception of the brief account concerning the links between these two events that I wrote in Political Polytheism. No recent Calvinist historian has commented on it. When the 18th century Presbyterians became Whigs ecclesiastical, the political and judicial character of Presbyterianism changed radically. The Presbyterians became the black-robed anointing army of the social philosophy and politics of the Scottish Enlightenment. The Confessional Revision of 1788 is the judicial foundation of modern Presbyterianism's political pluralism, yet this is seldom acknowledged publicly and never discussed with the historical background. In this instance, the past has not merely been abused, it has been self-consciously buried. The fundamental political fact of the 1788 revision is also never discussed. It represented the triumph of Servetus. It is politically Unitarian. Not so in the 17th century. The editors of Theonomy, a Reformed Critique, did me a favor when they bunched three essays together in one section. Quote, Theonomy and the Reformed Heritage, Historical Connections, end quote. W. Robert Godfrey tells us what Gordon Conwell Seminary would like us to believe about Calvin. Sinclair B. Ferguson takes us through the Westminster Assembly. Finally, Samuel T. Logan turns the New England Puritans into such flexible fellows that one has difficulty understanding why Roger Williams tramped through the snow in the middle of a Massachusetts winter just to escape from them. W. Robert Godfrey I first heard of Dr. Godfrey the day I brought my new wife in 1972 to Westminster Seminary for a three-hour visit. I had not expected that it would take so long. That day, there was a special lecture on campus by then Mr. Godfrey, Ph.D. 1974, Stanford University, plus several years at Gordon-Conwell. It was a very special kind of lecture. It was a job audition. He was being considered for a post on the faculty. As I say, I had never heard of Dr. Godfrey. Nevertheless, I told my wife the following, which she still remembers clearly, quote, You are about to hear the most boring lecture you have ever heard, end quote. She answered, quote, How do you know that? End quote. I replied, quote, The guy is after a job. He has to show his stuff, which means he has to prove that he is a scholar. This means, above all, that he must avoid getting caught making a mistake. So what he will do is summarize his doctoral dissertation, since doctoral dissertations are so narrow that if they are selected properly, nobody previously has bothered to write directly on the topic. This is why he will summarize his dissertation. That way, it is unlikely that any professor will catch him in a mistake, end quote. I knew what I was talking about. I was then completing my doctoral dissertation. We went to the lecture. The room was warm. The lecture was incredibly dry. It was, of course, a summary of what later became his doctoral dissertation. Afterwards, my wife said, quote, I was so embarrassed, I kept dozing off. That was the most boring lecture I've ever heard, end quote. Actually, I found it kind of interesting, dry beyond belief, but technically interesting. I had never imagined that James I was a semi-sympathizer of Calvinism, which is the distinct impression I got from Mr. Godfrey's lecture. It was also not the impression I got from Otto Scott's biography of James I. But Scott never went to college, so what does he know? I have no idea whether Dr. Godfrey can speak well. Someone told me that he can. But merely being able to speak well has zero bearing on the predictable nature of job-seeking academic performances. The medium shapes the performance. What impressed me at the time, however, was that the James I, whom I had come to hate, a legacy perhaps of my having read the Puritan's opinions of James I and his archbishop, Laud, was presented in a very different light. I marveled at the ability of Dr. Godfrey to create a kind of professionally retouched portrait. When I read his chapter on Calvin, I marveled once again. My basic answer to Godfrey is chapter 2, Calvin's Divided Judicial Legacy. There the reader is directed to citations from Calvin's writings, especially his sermons on Deuteronomy. Let me point out here that Godfrey does not once refer to the existence of these sermons. Thus, it is relatively easy for him to make the case that Calvin was not a theonomist. If you deliberately ignore the documentary evidence that supports the view of Calvin as a theonomist, then polemical, tract writing disguised as historical scholarship becomes duck soup. <laughs>
Most readers are none the wiser. Misled, yes, but none the wiser. Is he unfamiliar with those sermons? Of course not. Even if he has not read them, Jack Sawyer cites them repeatedly in his 1986 Westminster THM thesis, which Godfrey refers to in footnote number two. Did he just forget to mention them? Then he has not taken theonomy seriously, since James Jordan began his project of republishing Calvin's sermons on Deuteronomy in a newsletter, Calvin Speaks, published by Geneva Ministries from 1980 to 1984. Sawyer's thesis also refers to Calvin Speaks. Godfrey was remiss in not discussing the sermons at length, since their very existence refutes his thesis of Calvin as a theologian who systematically opposed the Old Testament's civil sanctions. Sometimes Calvin did oppose them, and sometimes he didn't. Godfrey shows that Calvin believed in a Christian state, in which the magistrate brings sanctions against heresy. Calvin believed in the state's enforcement of all Ten Commandments. Already, one thing is sure— Calvin was surely not a 1788 American Revised Westminster Confession man. Calvin rejected the Old Testament's civil laws as no longer binding on the New Testament civil magistrate, Godfrey says. He is correct, but on what basis could Calvin argue this way? This is the old theonomic question. Quote, if not biblical law, then what? End quote. Godfrey knows full well how Calvin argued, and he cites the Institutes, Book 4, Chapter 20, Section 16. This is Calvin's defense of natural law theory. Quote, the law of God, which we call the moral law, is nothing else than a testimony of natural law, and of that conscience which God has engraved upon the minds of men. Consequently, the entire scheme of this equity of which we are now speaking has been prescribed in it. Hence, this equity alone must be the goal and rule and limit of all laws. End quote. Godfrey makes it plain, at least with respect to Calvin's institutes, that, quote, Calvin uses the law of nature to criticize the law of Moses and declare it morally inferior, end quote. This is why Rush Dooney was so explicit in his rejection of Calvin on this point. He correctly identified the source of Calvin's error, his training in classical humanism. Rush Dooney is a lo loyal follower of Van Til on the question of natural law. He knew that he had to break publicly with Calvin on the natural law question. Godfrey, in contrast, does not break with Calvin on this point. He is a faithful defender of Westminster's new confession. What is astounding is that Godfrey says that, quote, Calvin's conception of natural law and civil government is drawn from Scripture, especially Romans 1, 2, and 13, and is used to interpret Scripture, end quote. Here it is again. The inescapable choice, Calvin or Van Til, you cannot have both. And it is clear in this book what Westminster's new confession is, Calvin, not Van Til. Godfrey says that theonomists teach that the state should execute apostates. He offers no proof, and Bonson categorically denies this interpretation of theonomy. As co-editor, Godfrey would have been wise to pay closer attention to Dennis Johnson's article, which clearly states that theonomists and non-theonomists agree that, quote, under the new covenant, the purity of the covenant community is maintained not by physical sanctions, but by spiritual discipline, excommunication, not execution, dot, 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 end quote. Let me give another example of the kind of contempt for God's law that is now common at Westminster. Godfrey writes, Theonomists believe that adulterers should be executed because Moses said so. It is as simple as that, end quote. May I ask, what is wrong with obeying what you believe is God's command, even if you do not understand the reasons why? What kind of arrogant rationalism has now captured Westminster? We should search for the reasons behind God's laws, not because we require him to justify himself when asking our obedience, but in order that we might obey God's commands more thoroughly. In any case, Godfrey's accusation is misguided. This is the old theonomist's as judicial simpletons argument that Frame and Meether adopt, our supposedly simplistic appeal to Scripture. What are the facts? Ray Sutton devotes an entire book to the concept of divorce by covenantal execution, with the capital sanction as the Bible's archetype. Not one author cites Sutton's Second Chance in Theonomy, a Reformed Critique, 
you might conclude from this remarkable absence that today's Reformed churches have no problems with counseling divorced people. Covenantal divorce? What's that? In my recent book, Tools of Dominion, I devote seven pages to a discussion of the capital penalty for adultery and why the Mosaic Law specified that the victimized spouse was responsible for both prosecuting and setting the penalty. I have explained why this capital sanction was consistent with the Bible's judicial general principle of victims' rights, and I also discuss why this law of adultery strengthens the family. I spent four pages in both books on the woman taken in adultery. Probably a waste of my time, according to McCartney and Johnson. So to put it bluntly, Godfrey is faking it. While he has a legitimate excuse for not having read my very recent expositions, he has no excuse for not having read Sutton's 1987 book. It was in the Biblical Blueprint series. His article gives almost no indication that he has read anything we have written. He cites neither Bonson's Theonomy nor Rush Dooney's Institutes. Both of these books include sections on the biblical sanctions against adultery, and they refute what he says that we say. First, Bonson states specifically that adultery was not always punished by execution. Page 106, note. Second, Rush Dooney spends nine pages on the social reasons for the capital sanction. Pages 392 through 401. Godfrey then says that Calvin was not like the Theonomists. Yes, Calvin did say that adulterers should be executed. Would this decimate America's antinomian pastoral ranks in a hurry? He does not simply appeal to Moses, but reasons from the equity of the moral law. Get the picture? Biblical revelation is not sufficient. We also need equity, and equity, as Godfrey points out, is tied to natural law theory in Calvin's theology. He is correct. It is. Calvin or Van Til? Calvin or Van Til? They cannot escape the choice, nor have they. They have abandoned Van Til. He ends with this attempted coup de grace. The Theonomists, quote, are far from Calvin's sober all millennialism, end quote. No, we Theonomists are merely far from the Sunday school lessons of Dr. Godfrey's youth in the Christian Reformed Church. If Calvin was anything, he was postmillennial. See Appendix D. In summary, Dr. Godfrey's essay is systematic in its avoidance of those primary source documents that refute his case. Sinclair B. Ferguson Dr. Ferguson's title asks, quote, An assembly of theonomists? The teaching of the Westminster divines on the law of God, end quote. His answer gives away half the store to the theonomists. This is why I have few complaints. He is faithful to the diversity of judicial opinion at this remarkable committee of the saints. It is this diversity which the opponents of theonomy at the presbyterial level have steadfastly refused to acknowledge. It is not Ferguson who abuses history. It is theonomy's Presbyterian opponents who will now have to answer to Ferguson. His essay, like Moises Silva's, is not what I would call critical. Crucial, possibly, but not critical. No, he says, they were not theonomists. Of course, some of them did believe in executing people for the following crimes, adultery, witchcraft, and blasphemy. George Gillespie, in Aaron's Broad Blossoming, a book dedicated to the assembly, did write, quote, I know some divines hold that the judicial law of Moses, so far as concerneth the punishments of sins against the moral law, idolatry, blasphemy, Sabbath-breaking, adultery, theft, etc., ought to be a rule to the Christian magistrate, and, for my part, I wish more respect were had to it, and that it were more consulted with. End quote. Samuel Bolton saw the moral law of Christ as the extension of Mosaic law. Quote, Acknowledge the moral law as a rule of obedience and Christian walking, and there will be no falling out whether you take it as promulgated by Moses or as handed to you and renewed by Christ, end quote. Here is a concept that is almost exactly what we in the, quote, Tyler group, end quote, regard as ours. The Mosaic law renewed by Christ in his death, resurrection, and ascension. Ferguson refers to the general equity clause of the Westminster Confession. Fine, 
If it meant that natural law theory has replaced the old covenant obligations, Westminster Seminary's new confession, then Van Til was wrong. Someone on the faculty should say so in public. Nobody ever does. On the other hand, if Van Til was correct, then it is time to teach that the Westminster Assembly was presupposing a Christian interpretation of natural law, which is just fine with us theonomists, but fatal for Westminster's new confession. The historical argument has come a long way since 1973. Who in 1973 would have imagined that there were members of the Westminster Assembly who held views remarkably similar to Bonson's? Only someone such as James Jordan. Today, Ferguson is willing to admit that, quote, no single position on every aspect of the doctrine of the law was held by the divines at Westminster. They represented a variety of hues within a conservative spectrum on many doctrines, and specifically on the doctrine of the law of God, end quote. The assembly was an example of, quote, reformed inclusivism, end quote. Question. On what basis, then, do certain reformed presbyteries maintain an unofficial standing policy not to ordain ministers who are theonomists? And why is it that no theonomists teach at any reformed Presbyterian seminary campus? All talk of, quote, reformed inclusivism, end quote, is solve for guilty faculty consciences. It is a smokescreen for reformed exclusivism. There is no inclusivism at Westminster Seminary that is broad enough to include the theonomist's view of the law of God. Such a view of God's Bible-revealed law and its predictable historical sanctions is a violation of Westminster's confession. Therefore, Westminster could not hire Bonson and had to fire Shepard. Samuel T. Logan, Jr. It is time to sail the Atlantic and join the New England Puritans. This is the area of my own formal specialization, so I get to play Toto. It's curtain time. Dr. Logan offers us, quote, New England Puritans and the state, end quote. While he never mentions their existence, he is doing his best to refute the essays in the Journal of Christian Reconstruction, winter 1978-79, to Symposium on Puritanism and Law. In that volume, Bonson wrote an essay, quote, Introduction to John Cotton's Abstract of the Laws of New England, end quote. Reverend John Cotton was asked in 1636 to write a law code for the colony. He did. It became known as Moses, his judicials. He later wrote an abstract of the laws of New England. It was reprinted in the same issue of the JCR. These laws were theonomic. The capital crimes of the Old Covenant were included. It was never enacted into law, but it did serve as a model for Reverend Nathaniel Ward's proposed civil code, which in turn was used by the Massachusetts General Court as a model for the 1641 Body of Liberties. How important was Cotton's model? Consider the evaluation of Charles Lee Haskins, perhaps the major specialist in the area of early Massachusetts law. Quote, Cotton's draft was never enacted into law, and probably for that reason its importance has been generally ignored. Nevertheless, there are several reasons why it deserves to be remembered. To begin with, it was the first constructive effort to carry out the mandate of the general court and to produce a written body of laws which would serve as a constitution for the colony. Second, its heavy reliance upon scripture provides an important illustration of the strong religious influence which infused Puritan thinking about law and the administration of justice. This attitude was not confined to the Massachusetts leaders, but appeared also in England, particularly in the Interregnum, when fifth monarchists urged the abolition of the common law and the enactment of a simple code based upon the law of Moses. Third, it became the basis of the early laws enacted at New Haven and Southampton, and thus had an enduring influence outside Massachusetts. Finally, and most importantly, a number of provisions relating to crime and civil liberties found their way through the Body of Liberties of 1641 and the Code of 1648 into the permanent laws of the colony. End quote. Before we consider Dr. Logan's curious thesis, let us consider the 1641 Body of Liberties, 11 years after John Winthrop arrived on board the Arbella. As you read these laws, keep asking yourself, theonomic or theonomic? 
neo-evangelical. 1. If any man, after legal conviction, shall have or worship any other god but the Lord God, he shall be put to death. Deuteronomy 13, 6 and 10. Deuteronomy 17, 2 and 6. Exodus 22, 20. Number 2. If any man or woman be a witch, that is, hath or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. Exodus 22.18, Leviticus 20.27, Deuteronomy 18.10. Number 3. If any man shall blaspheme the name of God, the Father, Son, or Holy Ghost, with direct, express, presumptuous, or high-handed blasphemy, or shall curse God in the like manner, he shall be put to death. Leviticus 24, 15, and 16. Number 4. If any person commit any willful murder, which is manslaughter, committed upon premeditated malice, hatred, or cruelty, not in a man's necessary and just defense, nor by mere casualty against his will, he shall be put to death. Exodus 21, 12. Numbers 35, 25, 13, 14, 30, and 31. Number 5. If any person slayeth another suddenly in his anger or cruelty of passion, he shall be put to death. Numbers 25, 20, and 21. Leviticus 24, 17. Number 6. If any person shall slay another through guile, either by poisoning or other such devilish practice, he shall be put to death. Exodus 21, 14. Number 7. If any man or woman shall lie with any beast or brute creature by carnal copulation, they shall surely be put to death, and the beast shall be slain and buried and not eaten. Leviticus 20, 15 and 16. Number 8. If any man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abominations. They both shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, 13. Number 9. If any person committeth adultery with a married or espoused wife, the adulterer and adulteress shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, 19, and 18, 20, Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24. Number 10. If any man stealeth a man or mankind, he shall surely be put to death. Exodus 21, 16. Number 11. If any man rise up by false witness, wittingly and of purpose to take any, away any man's life, he shall be put to death. Deuteronomy 19, 16, 18, and 19. And number 12. If any man shall conspire and attempt any invasion, insurrection, or public rebellion against our commonwealth, or shall endeavor to surprise any town or towns, fort or forts, therein, or shall treacherously and perfidiously attempt the alteration and subversion of our frame of polity or government fundamentally, he shall be put to death. This list was Part 94 in a 98-part code. These capital laws were theonomic. Dr. Logan is not about to admit this fact. He denies that it is a fact. Yet he cannot easily deny that these laws were theonomic. Therefore, he takes the only other logical approach. Logan denies that they were laws. He spends his essay trying to prove this. I give him an A for effort and a D- minus for performance. What the reader needs to pay particular attention to is how Logan misuses Haskinson's book. It is worth noting that Dr. Logan does not reproduce this crucial list in his essay. He only talks mentions it briefly. Reading it makes all the difference. It shows that the Puritans were essentially theonomic in their view of capital crimes, given what was believed by all of non-Puritan Christendom regarding civil law in the mid-17th century. But Logan writes that, quote, This should not be taken to mean that Massachusetts Bay now had a law code, end quote. This is an odd argument. Please follow his justification for ma making such a statement. He quotes Haskins. Quote, As Haskins points out, quote, The body of liberties was less a code of existing laws than it was a compilation of constitutional provisions. Dot, dot, dot. Note, the three extra dots are Logan's. G.N. Viewed as a whole, it resembles a Bill of Rights of the type which was later to become a familiar feature of American state and federal constitutions. End quote. Citing Haskins is crucial at this point, for Haskins seems to buttress Logan's argument that the 1641 legal code was not really a legal code.
because this code was visibly theonomic, Logan has to call into question its historical authority. He cites the fact that the legislators continue to work on the codification project. He thereby seeks to persuade the reader that the 1641 code was not at all that significant. But it was significant. There is a major problem with Logan's argument. Haskins' statement is being misused. Haskins was not arguing that these laws were not laws. He was arguing only that taken as a whole, they did not constitute a code in the structural sense because of their lack of order. Logan knows this, which is why he left out Haskins' crucial explanatory statement by, quote, three-dotting, end quote, it. When you find a controversial quotation with three dots in the middle of it, history graduate students are taught, check the original source. Let us consider the missing passage. Quote, its 100 sections were, for the most part, framed in no logical order, and the majority of them dealt in a broad and general manner with such matters as the institutions of colony and town government and the relations between them, the relations between church and state, and judicial safeguards and processes, end quote. But he insists that the actual laws were taken seriously. It was a law code in terms of judicial content. Things now become clearer. Let us get them crystal clear. Haskins continues, quote, The body of liberties marked a notable step not only in the direction of reducing the colony laws to writing, but, more importantly, toward the development of a commonwealth of laws and not of men. Almost all of its provisions, most of them in more extended form, were ultimately reenacted in the Code of 1648 and became part of the permanent law of the colony. End quote. Was it a law code in terms of content? Was the 1641 Body of Liberties merely a Bill of Rights? What did John Winthrop think the Body of Liberties was? His diary records the following entry. Quote, this session of the General Court continued three weeks and established 100 laws which were called the Body of Liberties. End quote. Puritan era specialist Derrett Rutman calls it, quote, the Commonwealth's first code of laws, end quote. From the 1950s through the 1980s, and probably even today, the most respected and influential American historian of the early New England period was Yale's Edmund Morgan. His biography, biography of Winthrop is a classic and is still assigned in college classes. Here is how Morgan describes the 1641 code. Hint. Watch for that most despised word of all, blueprint. Quote, but the code was not merely a bill of rights to protect the inhabitants of Massachusetts from arbitrary government. It was a blueprint of the whole Puritan experiment, an attempt to spell out the dimensions of the New England way. End quote. I can almost hear Dr. Logan screaming in agony. His screams are about to grow louder. Quote, after much discussion and revision, the Code of Liberties was finally accepted by the General Court in December 1641. Winthrop recorded the fact in his journal without comment. He would doubtless have been happier if its provisions had been left unexpressed, but he probably found little to quarrel with in the substance of them. They defined the New England way for all to see, and if this might bring trouble, it might also prompt the world to imitation." End quote. But if we are to accept Dr. Logan's peculiar explanation of this code, it was not a code, and it therefore was not law, then we must conclude that Edmund Morgan just did not know what he was talking about. Poor old Edmund Morgan. How could Morgan hold such a view of the 1641 body of liberties? Is it because Bonson never was academically eligible to teach in Morgan's history department? Let us look at another passage from Haskins that Logan failed to cite. This passage traces the capital crime sanctions back to John Cotton's, Moses, his judicials. Quote, Among the most important of the public law provisions were those relating to capital crimes. Nearly all of these were drawn from, and were annotated to, the Mosaic Code of the Old Testament, and many undoubtedly had their origin in John Cotton's proposed draft of 1636. End quote. Notice the phrase, quote, public law provisions, end quote. These were laws. The same capital laws also became the laws of Connecticut in 1642. 
I am afraid that Dr. Logan suffers from a very severe case of conveniently selective quotations. Let the reader be aware of the professor's intellectually debilitating condition. In writing this essay, he abandoned his calling as a historian in order to become a polemicist. Since he is not a very competent polemicist, let us hope that he will soon return to his original calling. Work on the colony's legal code continued until 1648. The 1641 code was not a permanent constitution, nor was it intended to be. Winthrop had feared as early as 1639 that any absolute, final legal codification of New England's laws could be used by the colony's enemies in England if the judicial specifics seemed to be different from English common law. Quote, For that it would professedly transgress the limits of our character, which provide, we shall make no laws repugnant to the laws of England, and that we were assured we must do. But to raise up laws by practice and custom had been no transgression. Dot, dot, dot. End quote. This second body of liberties was published in 1648. The year before, another large judicial code was produced by the authorities, quote, Book of the General Laws and Liberties Governing the Inhabitants of the Massachusetts, 1647, end quote. It was the model for the 1648 code. This explanatory sentence was added to the document's introduction. The older code of 1641 was, quote, published about seven years since, which contains also many laws and orders for both civil and criminal causes. It is commonly, though without ground, reported to be our fundamentals. Dot, 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 end quote. What did this mean, fundamentals? This probably refers to the original Constitution document of Connecticut, passed in 1639, which is sometimes said to be the first written Republican Constitution in history. It was called, quote, Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, end quote. It spelled out the structure of the civil government, specified twice yearly general assemblies, identified state officers, etc. It was not a law code. It was the frame of civil government. The Code of 1647 specifically stated that neither it nor the 1641 document should be regarded as fundamentals. They still had their eyes on England. Quote, We have not published it as a perfect body of laws sufficient to carry on the government established for future times nor could it be expected that we should promise such a thing. For if it be no disparagement to the wisdom of that high court of the Parliament in England, that in four hundred years they could not so compile their laws and regulate proceedings in courts of justice, etc., but that they had still new work to do of the same kind almost every Parliament, there can be no just cause to blame a poor colony, being unfurnished of lawyers and statesmen, that in eighteen years has produced no more nor better rules for a good and settled government than in this book holds forth, end quote. The document continues, quote, These laws which were made successively in diverse former years we have reduced under several heads in alphabetical method, that so they might the more readily be found, dot, dot, dot. For such laws and orders are, as are not of general concernment, we have not put them into this book, but they remain still in force and are to be seen in the book of the records of the court, End quote. What were they, these general laws? They dealt with limiting the civil government, protecting men from unlawful arrest, establishing county courts, the council, elections, defining free men and non-free men, access to courts, magistrates, and voting. This section does sound more like a Bill of Rights. The 1648 Code printed document reprints the 1641 list of capital crimes, but without the Bible verses. Haskins says that this, this 1648 code, quote, became the fountainhead of Massachusetts law during most of the 17th century and even thereafter, and its provisions were widely copied by other colonies or used by them as models in framing their own laws, end quote. So important were these capital laws in the thinking of the residents of Massachusetts that in 1642 they passed one of the worst laws in American history the first compulsory education law, with the requirement that the town treasuries should be used to support indigent students. What was the stated justification of this law? In 1648, they added this explanation, to provide, quote, their children and apprentices so much learning as may enable them perfectly to read the English tongue and knowledge of the capital laws, dot, 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 end quote. 
they did not have a fully developed biblical casuistry of the case laws, since they were still under the influence of medieval scholasticism, but they were farther along than Westminster Seminary is today. Wherever the penalties were specified in the Old Testament, the Massachusetts Puritans adopted them. The issue for them was faithfulness in honoring God's required sanctions. They put this principle in italics in the 1647 Code, quote, The execution of the law is the life of the law, end quote. It is this fundamental judicial principle that Westminster Seminary has been trying to escape. So has all of modern evangelicalism. This is why there is such hostility to the Puritans as they really were. Studied Flexibility Why spend so much space on this? Because Dr. Logan tries to prove that none of this can be used to support the thesis that Puritan New England was theonomic. He devotes page after page to this remarkable and historiographically unique effort. His goal is to prove that the New England Puritans were devotees of something he calls studied flexibility. Shades of Gordon Conwell Quote, Studied flexibility does seem, therefore, to be the best way to characterize a Puritan use of the Mosaic judicial law. End quote. It does seem this way if you are trying to lead the reader away from the fact that in 1641 the colony compiled a law code that specified execution for the crimes the Old Testaments specified as capital crimes, and then cited the verses of these case laws. So, Logan sees only studied flexibility? Question. Flexibility within which worldview? That of modern jurisprudence or that of the Old Testament? The Puritans began with the Old Testament. The chief question is, what did they specify as the general legal guide for their civil courts? This was made plain by the 1641 Code. It was also maintained by Winthrop. Quote, All punishments except such as are made certain in the law of God or are not subject to variation by merit of circumstances ought to be left arbitrary to the wisdom of the judges, end quote. This statement appears on the page following his description of the 1641 body of liberties as a list of 100 laws. What was quite plain to the man who was repeatedly elected the governor of the colony is not clear to Dr. Logan, who has a vested interest in blurring the issues. What is that interest? To justify the fundamental proposition of Westminster's confession, quote, the very idea of Christendom is barbaric. Therefore, Westminster could not hire Bonson and had to fire Shepherd. Winthrop's diary reports that a couple convicted of adultery in 1644 was executed. Quote, they were both executed. They both died very penitently, especially the woman who had some comfortable hope of pardon of her sin and gave good exhortation to all young maids to be obedient to their parents and to take heed of evil company, etc. End quote. In 1648, the year of publication of the Body of Liberties, Margaret Jones was convicted of witchcraft. She was hanged. Does this sound like Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary or Mount Sinai? Let me conclude with Haskins' assessment of the importance of the Mosaic Law in Puritan Massachusetts criminal law. Compare this with Logan's assessment. Quote, the, the capital laws are by no means the only part of the colonial criminal law that reflect biblical influence. The limitation on whipping sentences to 40 stripes, in contrast with the English formula, quote, until his body be bloody, end quote, was apparently based upon Deuteronomy 25, 2 and 3. Similarly, the fornication statute, which empowered the magistrates to enjoin the parties to marriage, was clearly agreeable to the word as set forth in Exodus 22.16, as contrasted with the then-current practice of English justices of the peace, who were primarily concerned with the economic problem of fixing responsibility for support of a bastard child upon its reputed father. Dot, 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 end quote. Quote, Another striking departure from English law, which apparently owed much to biblical authority, was the colonists' adoption of multiple restitution and involuntary servitude for theft. At common law, the theft was a, of a shilling, like other felonies, was punishable by hanging, and theft of a lesser amount by whipping. 
under a number of English statutes, restitution, single, double, or triple, was a common penalty imposed by justices of the peace for a variety of specified property crimes. The Bible, however, prescribed multiple restitution as the penalty of the theft in most cases. Or, quote, if he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft, end quote. Quote, from the beginning, the colonial magistrates regularly followed the biblical patterns, imposing double restitution when the offender was capable thereof, and requiring thieves unable to make restitution otherwise to satisfy the court's sentence by a term of service. The exactation of those penalties was without specific statutory authority until 1646. Prior thereto, the colonial treatment of theft furnishes an example of the shaping of law by magisterial discretion in the way favored by Winthrop. When restitution was feasible, it was usually the only punishment imposed, but the courts did not hesitate to combine it with one or more of a variety of other penalties, ranging through whipping, the stocks, a fine to the court, and degradation from the rank of gentlemen. End quote. Logan ends his essay with a familiar, though implied, accusation against the quote, simplistic theonomists. End quote. He writes, quote, Whatever else they were, the New England Puritans as a group were not simplistic. They did not see themselves as some kind of reincarnation of the nation of Israel, and they did not want to see Israel's judicial code reincarnated in their commonwealth. End quote. Here it is again. Theonomy as simplistic and theonomists as judicial simpletons. When the faculty of Westminster Seminary hears the words, quote, biblical law, end quote, they immediately think, quote, simplistic, end quote. They, of course, are much too sophisticated for such simplistic laws as those that God specified to the people of Israel. Biblical casuistry is not for them. Natural law will do just fine. Dr. Logan is the Dean of Academic Affairs at Westminster, the same post held for two decades by Edmund Clowney, 1963-82. to 82. It is a very important position. It establishes the seminary's academic standards. The academic performance of the man who holds it inevitably becomes a symbol of those standards. Conclusion History moves forward. No Christian group can claim that any predecessors in church history came fully to the ideal order set forth by the latest representatives of that tradition. There is progressive corporate sanctification in history, a statement that cannot be accepted by common grace on millennialists, despite the fact that they cannot study church history and the history of the creeds and come to any other valid conclusion. So, to imagine that we can find the comprehensive position of the modern theonomic movement expressed in Puritanism, would be naive. Such a statement would rest upon a view of history that is amillennial, Mether's flatline historical development, rather than postmillennial. The historical question is more complex. What foundations of the present worldview can be found in the past, as consistently applied, then, as the times allowed? Ask this question, and you can begin to study historical origins, Dr. Ferguson's article comes reasonably close to understanding this task. Dr. Godfrey's and Dr. Logan's do not. The question Dr. Godfrey needs to ask is this. What about Calvin's sermons on Deuteronomy? The question Dr. Logan needs to ask and then answer in detail is this. What prior judicial tradition in church history was best represented by the New England Puritans of the first generation? If he cannot find any and this, in my view, is the case. Then the first generation New England Puritans, 1630-60, to 60, must be seen as judicially revolutionary, constituting a significant discontinuity in church history. They can be connected with some of the Scottish Covenanters, perhaps, and surely with Calvin's sermons on Deuteronomy, a possibility left unexplored by Dr. Godfrey. But if we are asking the question in terms of an actual cultural judicial experiment, the first generation New England Puritans were unique. More than this, they self-consciously viewed themselves as unique. Their covenantal experiment, their city on a hill, would, they hoped, become a model to fall in Europe and also to a growing new nation in the, in the future, a nation founded in the wilderness. They had been delivered from Egypt, they were in the wilderness, and they hoped to enter the Promised Land. 
they understood that they were in both a geographical and spiritual wilderness. Being postmillennialists, they did not expect to remain there. In this sense, the Theonomists are the spiritual heirs of the New England Puritans. The Westminster faculty is not. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.